Welcome to Between the Vines. My name is Kevin Martin. I'm here with Jennifer Phillips Russo and Annie, Andy Musa. Uh, we are the Lake Erie Regional Grape Program, and we're here to talk about a couple of different things today, but mostly we wanted to bring you an update from the field regarding phenology uh, as of 4-25-2022. Um, and I'm not going to introduce it any further than that. I think Jen and uh, some other staff members at Clarel um, were out looking at phenology, and I'll let her update everybody. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. So we do, we actually have a historical phenology running for our lab for the um, Cornell Lake Erie Research and Extension Lab, which didn't start here. We've been here over a decade, but it started at the Fredonia Lab, so relatively in the same area in our region. And that's been going on for over 40 years. So we have a really good historical backline. We can go back and see, are we getting earlier? Are we getting later? What years do we measure up to? And we start it as soon as the weather starts to get nice and you would anticipate the vines moving and you see a lot of bleeding. We hear them from growers, a lot of the suckers. So about that time we go out and start monitoring the vines. And the team goes out into the same block looking at the same vines over and over again year after year so that we can have be fairly certain that all of the management strategies have remained the same. And we started that last week. So as of last week, Friday on the 22nd, Keep in mind there are two different scales that you can use. There's the um, EL scale or we, Eckenhorn Lorenzo, it's hard for me to say, and we use the modified Shawless field scale. You can find that field scale if you want to look out at your own vines and see where you are at what number because we're going to talk about some numbers here and what they correspond to. And that is on our LERGP dot com website right on that landing page just scroll down and you'll see it and there's also a button for the historical phenology if you want to check that out as well but as of friday we were at a scale that we call 1.5 so basically there was some bud swell in there but we would still consider that if you were looking at our website we would still consider that dormant, not quite at the first swell where the brownish woolly part or the scales are um, visible. So some of them were, and by the way, we count that at 50% of the buds have to be at that before we can call that number. So you can't just find one or two and then say, oh, there it is. It has to be the majority of the, the buds on the vine. Does anybody have any questions before I keep going with this? So, um, so you're saying, you know, if you're looking for 50%, um, just before that first swell, is that right? Yes. Um, 1.5. So Go ahead. There were some that were still dormant then? Absolutely. There and were some that some were still dormant and there were some that were a little bit more than that. Yes. Yeah, so, so a little bit more would be like that brownish wool was easy to see kind of thing. Right. They sort of ran the gamut between that those two stages for a one so, point. Okay. Exactly, and I don't know if you can tell if you are looking at this as a video blog or not, but I have a reddish hue to myself, and that's because I'm sunburnt from the gorgeous weather that we had this weekend out in my gardens, meaning that we've had those that heat acclimation and above 60 degrees, the vines were definitely moving faster so we had to go out today and monitor, or actually yesterday, the field team went out and did those same sentinel buds and came back with, I just want to scroll back really quick, I believe it's a 2.5 now. Yes, so as of yesterday, we were then at a 2.5, what we're calling an intermediate swell on the modified um, Shawless field scale. So if you go back and reference on that website, and by the way, this information has been given to you in the crop updates as well. So you have it to, if you go into your emails, which will be on Friday, I believe it's gonna go out. So you're saying you observed a, a 1.5 a little bit earlier in the week or? That what? was Friday. Was Friday was a 1.5. And then as of Monday, it had jumped to a 2.5, but we had those two gorgeous days in there. Right. Really helped okay. push them along. So now I know, what a lot, of, a lot, what is on a lot of your minds and what you're thinking, and I get this question from growers constantly around this time of year, 
And that is, what is the critical temperature now that the vines have started moving and coming out of dormancy that we can have survival? And that research has been done. Dr. Terry Bates has put together this si sort of a photo in critical temp time where you can see where the buds are at and where they are hardy to for frost and freeze. And that is also going to be given to you in our crop update. And for those, can I share my, my screen, Kevin? Yeah, I you can, can. Um, for sure. Let me come over here. Ask questions while I'm figuring it out because this takes yeah, a while. So, I was you know. say that if you look at last year on the 22nd, I was looking back at uh, last year's uh, crop updates and we were at uh, bud break or beyond in vineyards on the 22nd last year. So we are definitely, you know, behind last year. Right. Actually, last year's bud break and the historical phenology, what are you looking at? Are you looking at my critical temps? I want to make sure I'm not confusing everybody with what I pull up. Yeah, the critical yeah. temps. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I'm tiny little screen. I've got so many windows open. So last year, we actually called bud break here at the station at the lab in Portland, New York on April 20th. That was the official bud break day of last year. So we're six days behind that. Behind last year. Last year, correct. Right, so last yeah, year was pretty you, early, right? Yeah. Uh, on a more historical scale? Historical average over the last 40 years is May 4th. Okay. So, so yep. now if you're looking at this, what you have on the screen there, Jen, we're at what stage of swell would you? I would say if you can see this, yeah. You can see my cursor and you're listening. We're at a 2.5, which is, you know, there's a lot of the brown wooliness is there. Some of them even have a little bit of pink showing on the edges of them. Not many at all, but it was like, oh no, look, there's pink when we were out looking for them. So I would say most of them are going to be between 13 degrees and 25 degrees Fahrenheit that you're going to be okay down to those degrees. And if you're looking at the forecast, um, there, we're not going to hit that, or we're not projected to hit that anytime soon in the next. I know they're calling for snow on Wednesday, but where it's only going to be a high or a low of um, 32, I believe it was. Right. I was looking at it. So it's still above that 25, even if we were at 28. Yes, some of them are, and it is um, teetering on some of those. You might have some bud loss on that but you'll have your secondaries push hopefully there. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't expect, you'd have to miss on the forecast, which, you know, of course could happen, but right. if that forecast were to hold, you really wouldn't be that close to 25. Yeah, I think the lowest, um, if you look at the rest of the week is um, 33, 35 lows at night, so. And that's a good point, because if you look at the highs in the projected forecast as well, I think it's 63 on one day and 61 on the next, and then it just goes back down into the 50s and 40s. So I, I'm i anticipating that they may stall out a little bit and hold back. Yeah, I think this week, it, this cooler weather will definitely slow them down, and, you know, we don't have to worry about. But, you know, you're talking about average bud break. Um, that's May 4th, right? Yes. So depending on how warm it gets, I think it's supposed to warm up, what, Saturday and Sunday? And, yes. Uh, so, but it's still only going to be what the low 60s. 61 and 63 is yeah. projected. So, you know, we might be around average or probably if if the weather holds like, you know, they say it is um, probably uh, a little bit later than average um, for uh, bud break. Right. So, I definitely don't anticipate it being uh, before you know, the fourth. But no, I don't good. either, but yeah, hey, you never know. <laughs> At least I have a little comfort in knowing that I don't see the forecast dropping below that 25 degrees, so. Yeah, and so, I mean, at that point, we'll certainly see where they're vulnerable at higher temperatures, right, according to what you had shown. So once we hit bud break or 4.0, it'll be closer to what would that be like 29 I think, degrees? Or? I think it goes up to 28. Hold on, let me just pull my thing back up. So, hey, come up. Yeah, so 28 and 29. 
28, 29 when the leaves are definitely unfurling. That beautiful pink hue that you get all over when you're looking out there, that's the 29 degrees. But anything obviously tighter is lower. Right. So, yeah, I mean, that's hopefully because... we continue to see some progress in the lake temperatures because it's it's fairly cold, but it's sort of where you would expect it to be, right? Like, you know, on average, there's always a risk of a frost, so it never looks ideal or great uh, when it's average because there is always that risk. So, you know, I think we're close. It's it's more comfortable than we were, say, last year when things were um, 10 days early, give or take. And then that, even looking at the lake temperature last year, it was, you know, that that deeper water lake temperature was in the, was 41, 42 at bud break. And we're already there now. And, you know, we've got a week before bud break. So even that'll look a little bit better, um, which is not a bad thing when, the, when we're relying on that so much this time of year. So. Then again, going back to the uh, 22nd of last year, of uh, April, uh, that's when we got the, temperatures I checked to the newest stations uh, in the region and they reached 28 29 degrees or lower and that's when we were at bud break so, yeah that was it was bad last year and then we had another one on May 8th and 9th frost freeze event that was like the frost that never happened right <laughs> <laughs> yeah with the with the averages yeah, that came was, in last year <laughs> I don't know where all those lost grapes went but they came back <laughs> apparently so I think we we could take another frost like that, but yeah, I mean, what date did you say? It was May eighth. May eighth and ninth. I remember having to do some work for um, damage, you know, to get the. Yeah. Why can't I even yeah, think? Yeah, I mean, that was definitely damage. I, I, you know, that was a little tongue in cheek. Like things did die. It was just there was disaster. enough out there. I had to yeah. get it called a disaster. That's what it was. <laughs> Yeah, there was enough out there that you never noticed it in your average yields compared to your historic yields. But but yeah, there is definitely damage out there as late as, like you said, May 8th, May 9th. So, um, yeah, if this. But they were also much further along at sure. that time. Right. So we'll see where we're at May 8th, May 9th. Right. And it looks like we won't be anywhere near as far along. Right. I mean, it could just be bug break if things cool down, but it might. I would guess it'll be a little further along than that. So what does that mean, Andy, in regards to where we are? Is there, isn't there a bug that we should be looking for right about now? Yeah, that'd be grape flea beetle. Mm -hmm. um, and about now when they start to swell like that, that's going to be the first insect that's uh, out in the vineyard. And um, What do you look for? Uh, you can either look for the beetle, but more you're more apt to probably just look for the damage. Um, yeah, they're the first ones that come out. They're the, the beetles over winter as adults, and then they come out. Um, usually, you know, from wooded areas, they'll overwinter in the woods or trashy areas. Um, and they're most prevalent uh, probably towards the um, border rows, you know, anywhere where there's woods or trashy areas. And then when the buds start to swell, they'll move to the vines and start to feed. And, and they literally just eat the buds, correct? Yes, yes, they'll just eat the buds. And again, uh, you should be out scouting, especially those areas right along the woods and or if you have some trashy areas. Um, and look for, again, the, the feeding on the buds. And if you get 2% of bud injury, then that's what we suggest that you should apply a spray uh, so that's that's sort of the threshold that we go by for um, for the flea beetle and then the um, cutworms climbing cutworms are a little bit you know um, as the buds swell a little bit more that's when um, you're more likely to get the uh, cutworm injury but the injury looks fairly similar for both the um, flea beetle and the climbing cutworms so those are the two insects that you know growers should really start looking for. So is it important to distinguish between the two, or? Well, good question. Uh, as far as what chemical controls you can use, you've got 
more options um, with with the climbing cutworms. But that being said, you also probably will have less likelihood of having cutworm climbing cutworm injury. I know in the years that I've been looking, um, I've only seen it in a few times and in certain vineyards, it's maybe vineyards with lighter or sandier soils. Um, if underneath the row, you've got weeds, there are situations where you're more likely to get climbing cutworm injury. Whereas the flea beetles would be, um, say, more towards the, the border rows where, because they'd be overwintering in, you know, the woods or trashy areas and then moving into the vineyard. So when I've seen um, climbing cutworm, again, I, I've seen it away from the woods, but it was like on sandy knolls and they mm. had, you know, weed, weed cover underneath. And what will happen is those cutworms will hide underneath uh, the trellis or underneath the bark on the trunk during the day. And then at night they come out to feed the buds. And, and the thing is, yeah, it's pretty cool because we went out years ago when we were looking at this. And we, if you go out with flashlights, you know, you can actually see them up on the, yeah, feeding on the buds if you have a, <laughs> if you have a problem. But again, um, that's been rare, the climbing cutworm. I've seen flea beetle more often. But really, over the last so many years, I haven't really seen, you know, either one of them much. So, you know, the chances that guys are going to have to spray for those is probably low. But if you have those areas, you should be out there because if you completely ignore it and you've got it and the populations have built up, you can get, um, you know, you can get uh, quite a bit of butt injury if you're not looking. Huh. yeah so i mean that should cover us for the next few weeks right like yes nobody's yeah. thinking about ebdc's yet um the only well, the only thing positive. is again depending on um next week if it's in the 60s we'll probably won't be so maybe in two weeks depending on the temperatures we might be getting into where you have to start looking at uh Phomopsis, and sure. powdery. If you're at the like one inch stage, and that's it. One inch stage would be for powdery would be uh, say vinifera varieties, uh, right? Uh, especially if you've had you know, if you didn't have good management uh, the year before. Uh, as far as phomopsis, that would be the same thing. If you've had some bad phomopsis, um, you know, and you know maybe if you didn't get some things trimmed as well as you should have or trimmed at all or uh, then you know you might be wanting to look at the one inch stage um, if you have a lo lot of inoculum otherwise um, you know by the three to five inch stage definitely we recommend you know even in the concords putting on a phomopsis spray like you said the EBDCs that take us up Zyre River County and, um, and definitely putting on something for powdery mildew to three to five if you have uh, vinifera. Right. So Andy, I have a question only because it actually did come through for me and I'm sorry if I'm putting you on the spot here, but it was basically around an organic grower or people who are trying to be more sustainable. And they were vinifera growers asking at this dormant stage about applying things to prevent it before even bud break happens. So they were talking about, you know, oils. Do you have Lime anything? Sulfur is, is one of the ones that guys have put on. Um, <sighs> I don't, I mean, I, I, I think research has shown that it does help, but it's kind of nasty, you know, to apply. And uh, I'm not sure. I don't think any of our guys uh, up here, you know, do that, even with the uh, vinifera. But again, if you're organic, your options are fairly. Yeah. Limited. I mean, I would say, you know, if you were full on organic, you're obviously thinking about grapes as a very different system. Um, so maybe something like an oil, purely just to delay bud break, if you're not concerned about bud break, you know, if you've got a late season red and somebody right. tells you to delay bud break, you might, you might roll your eyes a little bit. <laughs> yeah, we want that up here. 
<laughs> right. But, um, you know, if you've got something that where you don't care if bud break is delayed and you can sort of hope that everything catches up later, um, you know, you might be subject to less um, infection periods if you delay bud break. I, I don't know that it would, you know, I'd leave it to Andy to talk about the effic direct efficacy, but, uh, you know, I guess thinking about it as a system, I, I think maybe you could lower your, <clears throat> lower your exposure would be probably the best thing you could hope for. And, you know, I mean, that works effectively in Concords when weather does it for us, right? Like sometimes it's very awkward to try to put on sprays and we, we um, it just seems like the period between three inches and uh, between three inches of shoot growth and bloom, it just varies so much. It's all right. of a sudden that 10 day interval is, is easy to do. And then the next year, you know, you're, that means you're going to put on four sprays because that, that 30 days is not long enough. So delaying a bud break when you're, when things are early, which is not even the case this year, but I mean, if you're organic, maybe you want things to be late and then everything moves really fast, which makes disease control easier. That'd be the only thing I could think of. But again, thinking about it as a system, I don't think that would be enough to get you to be organic by itself. Well, the lime sulfur, uh, mm -hmm. again, if I would really, you know, in a conventional system, um, I would really recommend to growers to use that. They could, uh, and, and there is some efficacy, uh, but I would be more apt to suggest or at least consider that, you know, growers could just consider that if they're on a full organic system. Because again, you know, your options definitely aren't as, as good. So, you know, in an organic system, yeah, uh, a delayed dormant uh, a lime sulfur uh, would be a possibility. But uh, up here where we have, you know, some more options, uh, I would just, you know, start, if you're going to do that, I would start the one inch with, you know, some of our conventional materials. But again, you're, with organic systems, you're, you're you know, kind of hampered in, in what materials you have that are effective. And I guess I should just add that Cornell does have a 2022 organic production and IPM guide for grapes and it has just been put out there. So you can, you can search that, do a Google search on just the 2022 organic production and IPM guide for grapes, or you can go to the ecommons.cornell.edu and search for it there because that's where it's housed. Yeah, I mean, I would say that resource will give you the best options available to you other than maybe some of the newer technology stuff. But in terms of direct control with materials, that is going to be your important resource. Yeah, um, I, I definitely, if you're an organic grower, you definitely should have that and, and check it out. But I'm not sure that, you know, in our climate in all years that it's it's super effective either and vinifera, right? Like it's going to give you some really good tools to control most diseases but in the wrong year things like black rot it's going to you know if you follow it it's going to allow you to hopefully keep it down to a dull roar but but it, you're going to have a crop in the wrong year sorry my my phone fell so yeah i mean i would certainly make sure i had that on my bookshelf if i was trying to do some organic things Well, I guess you could also just um, get off the organic and getting back to the phenology and stuff. Make sure that you are checking our website and checking your crop updates and out checking your own vineyards using that either either scale, whichever one you works for you. But if you're going to go on what we're talking about, we use the modified Shawless field scale and it is on our website, LERGP, so that you can sort of walk along and know where you are. Yeah, and the only other thing I would add, I know you tried to move back to that field score, but you know, there are a lot of things I think we could do in the vineyard if you really sprays, especially on a smaller scale that might not be technically organic. Like there's a lot of options out there, I think, for reducing the chemicals you use. Oh, right. Okay. And I think we're seeing some pressure from processors and potentially some of the markets where we may have to start considering some of those options where, you know, 
there are, there aren't going to be I don't think any grape juice processors in the next 10 years that require organic production but there may be some limitations put on insecticides pesticides fungicides that um, cause us to think differently about how we approach disease control I guess and some of those options are available and I guess that's a really nice Thing to add there because during our winter growers conference we did have a talk by dr katie gold from cornell university who was talking about alternatives for your toolbox so if you have questions about that meaning she had some biocontrols in there used along with conventional that spray programs that were helpful so there's research going on about that yeah there's definitely more biopesticides that are coming along and some of them look uh you know they're, they're looking better and better as newer ones are coming on and so um, you know there definitely could be a place for them um, even during the season uh, especially if you know you don't if you have diseases under control and it's at a time of the season where the pressure isn't that great and then you know you could maybe fit some of those biopesticides in there. Um, and I think you're going to be seeing more and more of that as we go on, uh, you know, down the road. Plus, I think, you know, there's more, there is more research going into those. There's more coming yeah. online. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, you, you'll start to see more of those uh, come into the mainstream, you know, as we, we go along. Yeah, some of it's really in a research stage, but it looks promising and I feel like something's going to stick, right? Um, the biocontrols are really commercially available at this point, some of them. Um, but UV light control and the right. electric weed sprayer that Cornell's working on, and you know, hopefully we don't get back to tillage, but I think some people are playing around with tillage, but hopefully we can avoid that. Um, but well, I think tillage has its place when you have some of those really stubborn, you know, weeds that just won't, and you need to get in there and just get them out. <laughs> And you know me, I don't talk about doing... <laughs> yeah, no, it, I mean, that's, I think that's, you know, no-till as a system in, certainly in Concord production, but really in most, most acreage in our climate has really become ingrained in how we operate because, you know, we, we switched to no-till um, between 25, probably 30, and 45 years ago. And so everything changed over the course of 45 years, you know, tractors got larger, equipment got bigger, um, the way we control things changed in terms of our spray timings, when we harvest changed. Um, and all of those things rely on having a vineyard floor that has stability. So if you change back, then you either have to change back and adjust something so you don't need that stability or get it with cover crops fast enough. Uh, when you've you know disrupted everything in July or something, or you've got to really rethink your entire system. Whereas you know, an electric weeder, you don't really have to rethink your system so much. There might be a change in your labor force, but it fits in with your system. And I'd like to see um, sort of management of maybe some of those weeds rather than tillage uh, in, in the cover crop area. And, yes. and I think, you know, with work that you guys are doing, with the cover crops and you know growers are playing around with it more i think you're gonna you see that more customized as we go down the road and i'd rather see that than you know getting back into where we were where you disc and then road it till and right. it looked, it looked right. nice and smooth <laughs> well and honestly that is a push that is a push right now in both federal and state legislation for climate smart farming is to get, and I'm so proud of our industry for being no-till for so long, but they're trying to get that into other systems now moving forward. This right. just has so many benefits. Yeah, I mean, no-till really relied on Roundup for a long time, so there's gotta be a new way to do no-till in, in the fairly near future. I think the writing's sort of on the wall. I think most of our growers know that, but you know, this was really a podcast about the fact that it really is spring and the grapes are no longer <laughs> so um the rest of it was like ideas for future podcasts i think so if you if you see us at a coffee pot meeting or you want to reach out and contact us directly 
um, and you want to hear about this or something different, please, please let us know. Kevin, I think before we sign off, and I know that was a great spot to do so, was. our cover, our coffee pot meetings right. start this oh, yeah. week. <laughs> so we are having our very first coffee pot meeting tomorrow. If you are in our region, it's down in Northeast Pennsylvania. We'll be held at Arrowhead. Arrowhead so that's, Springs. Yep, yes. that's, that's where we're going tomorrow, and it's from 10 until noon. Yes. There are um, credits available. Man, there's so many more things we need to discuss. We have core credits coming to you. You guys asked for them and we were able to get some courses put together. So please look for the crop update to hear about those. There's actually some coming up on May 12th. Where so is that? I, that one is being held at Clarel right here at our lab in Portland, New York. Okay. And it is going to be for two New York core credits, and I believe Andy has submitted for Pennsylvania credits. I did yesterday after we talked. I submitted that yesterday, and um, they've been really uh, pretty quick in getting back uh, PDA. So uh, I, I expect to hear it maybe in the day or two, um, you know, about that course. Yes, for can... New York, that'll be four PA credits, but you know, those are pending, so we'll see. Pending, but yeah. But we definitely also have another opportunity coming up in June. All right. And we'll announce that once everything is settled. So um, again, I, I think that just reinforces what I was saying. This podcast is about spring today. Um, so with the growing <laughs> season, we'll be out and about. Uh, that might seem a bit unusual after a couple of years of COVID, but like like Jen mentioned, our first coffee pot meeting of the of the season in person tomorrow at Arrowhead Springs, and then those other meetings also in person at some facilities like Clarel and other places. So um, we look forward to seeing you all if you're if you're in the Lake Erie region. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, if there's not anything else, we'll see you next week. Have a great week, everyone.